Um, it's nice to uh, be here again this morning. Um, for those of you who don't know Hempsons, we are a law firm who um, focus on health and social care. Uh, that is what we do. And there we have uh, a number of, well, and many people across the firm who cover um, inquest work in for a number of different organisations and trusts. So we we work broadly across the country. Um, I am based in the northeast. I've worked in uh, from Newcastle for the last few yeah, 10, 12 years, not however many. Um, so primarily in the northeast, but uh, with the onset of COVID and hearings becoming more remote, I have worked wider and further afield. Um, what we are going to do today is give a, a very broad overview and um, introduction to inquest. So this is intended very much as a introductory session. So if you attend any of these sessions before, it is um, it, it is at very entry level. It is for those people who are essentially asked to go to an inquest or um, understand some of the basics about interest. If there's any sort of uh, attendees today who have um, more uh, involvement, more experience of inquest, this will probably be something of, of a refresher to you rather than learning anything particularly new. Um, so what are we going to do today? I think as, as Jess has mentioned, there'll be time for questions at the end so we can come back to any issues at the end um, if you have any particular queries. So looking at what we're going to look at today briefly, we're going to look at inquest in context, um, when an inquest is held, what the purpose is um, and what why you would have an inquest in the in the first place. Um, we're then going to look at why you may be called to attend a, an inquest in particular, what is expected of you and what capacity you might have been asked to attend. Uh, we'll look briefly at effective witness statements and reports and how they can uh, assist your attendance if you're being asked to go to an inquest and those professional obligations um, that you may be required to, well, you will be required to adhere to if you are being called to attend an inquest. Um, then some very practical points about what to expect if you're asked to attend an inquest, both, both remotely and in person, and how you can support colleagues. As I say, it's, it is intended as a broad overview, um, but we'll hopefully uh, touch on some fairly practical points and, and useful points as well. OK, so starting at the beginning, looking at inquests in context, obviously it, uh, the inquest um, uh, arises as a result of a, a bereavement and a death. So central to that, it's important to understand um, that an inquest is one process in the middle of a number of other processes that are on, ongoing. And central to that is obviously the human factors involved and the impact that any death might have on an individuals, patients, a family, um, staff who may have been involved. All these issues will be uh, require some support. But the inquest itself may uh, sit within a number of different elements. There's impact on a, a, an organisation in different ways, and the financial cost, the financial resources, um, reg regulator involvement and the potential press involvement of a, of a death that may have been potentially contentious. In a lot of cases, this is deaths are not particularly problematic and there are, uh, but there may arise a situation where there are other ongoing processes and that might be include um, the involvement of the CQC, HSC, uh, professional bodies involvement, um, action within the civil courts and um, hopefully rarely the police and criminal courts involvements and sitting within that will be the inquest process and it will be necessary to make sure that those elements of um, uh, processes around a death are pulled together appropriately and coordinated and are managed appropriately and that can include in terms of considering when the appropriate disclosures are made, considering the right people who are involved and pulled and supported in uh, for that process. I mean that in itself and, and I think many of the slides on that you'll see today could actually form training sessions in themselves. So in terms of where an inquest sits in a serious investigation process or um, any other process, that it's part of a bigger picture. So what is an inquest, which is what we're looking at today? So an inquest is a fact-finding investigation. As Lord Lane said, it is a judicial inquiry to ascertain the facts, ascertain, sorry, the facts relating to an incident, a fact-finding exercise and not a method of apportioning guilt. Um, there are no parties, there is no indictment, there is no prosecution, and there is no defence. It is an, a, a, an inquisitorial process to establish the facts. So in terms of what that actually looks like, obviously within an inquest, at the centre of any inquest should be uh, the bereaved family. Um, that has been emphasised more recently over the last few years. Um, it's a coroner-led process, a judicial process, led with the family very much at the centre of this process. It is not adversarial, which obviously means there's no sides. It's not like a, a civil court where um, 
or even the criminal court where there are clear demarcations of sides. It, it is it's a fact finding investigation where all parties work together to establish the facts and to assist the coroner at, to um, understand uh, the circumstances of, of, of a death and how someone came by their death. Um, we'll look at in a moment the, the purpose of uh, the inquest is to establish who the person was, when they died, where they died and how the death occurred and that that how the death occurred bit has potential different meanings. Again, we'll come to that in just a minute. Um, an inquest is limited. The remit is limited to matters which caused or contributed to the death. Um, there are circumstances in which border issues can be considered within an inquest, but essentially that is what um, the purpose of the inquest is. And the coroner is uh, um, tasked with reaching fairly neutral conclusions. He's not allowed to apportion uh, civil or criminal liability um, and there are rules against self-incrimination. Um, and as I said before, as it's, as it's an inquisitorial fact-finding, there are no cl closing speeches. Um, there are only legal submissions in terms of um, uh, presenting a case within a coroner's inquest. So at the start of an inquest, um, what are they essentially? There, there is a duty to report deaths to the coroner. Um, the notification regulations are from data from 2019 set out the requirements in which deaths must be reported to a coroner. I'm sure you might, you're, if, you, if you're working in a healthcare setting, you'll be familiar with these in any event. But they basically provide that um, uh, deaths reported to the coroner are those that are unnatural and, and where there has potentially been medical treatment. There are other um, provisions where their uh, deaths are due to either poisoning, exposure to toxic substances, medicinal products, uh, violence, uh, neglect and self-neglect. Um, uh, disease, injury uh, and, and any other unnatural death and where the cause of the death is unknown and where someone died in custody or in otherwise in state detention. Um, and, and those deaths would normally be reported to the coroner. The coroner then has a duty to investigate um, certain deaths once they've been made, made aware of uh, the deceased person within their own area and conduct an investigation into that death um, if uh, subsection 2 of the Coroners and Justice Act applies and thus this provides that the coroner has to investigate a death where the deceased died a violent or unnatural death, the cause of death is unknown and the, or the deceased died while in custody or otherwise in state detention. So an unnatural death is, an un, is unnatural if it is not resulted entirely from a naturally occurring disease process running its natural course and where nothing else is implicated. Um, this session used to cover potential uh, what well, the impact of COVID on on um, coroner's uh, inquests. Um, we've moved away from that slightly now, but um, just to let you know that in terms of uh, death related to COVID, um, that they are not um, necessarily uh, that whilst COVID is a naturally occurring disease, they may be treated as a natural cause of death um, for the purposes of the coroner. So when will an inquest be held? Um, and, and you probably, if you've been to an inquest or you've had experience of an inquest, you will have, have experience of some of these circumstances in which inquests are held. Um, where there is a death in custody, and that means a death in prison um, or a death while someone is detained under the Mental Health Act. Um, this could, um, this will also have, have implications to whether a, a, an inquest takes place with or without a jury um, and whether it is subject to um, Article 2, which again, I'll come on to in just a minute. Um, where there is a, hospital admission where there has been treatment involved in the care of someone who's recently deceased and this might include some circumstances where there have been issues around uh, a fall whilst in hospital or the, the um, management of pressure sores for instance. Uh, neonatal deaths are often uh, heard before a coroner um, and, and you tend to see some of the same issues recurring before a coroner um, and, and they may um, uh, be dealt with um, in similar ways by similar cor coroners. If there is a, a, a death in the community, um, they will also potentially become for a coroner. These can be uh, things such as um, where there's a history of uh, dementia. To give an example, uh, someone who was previously mobile and has had a fall, but it was not recorded. Um, circumstances that might give concern to family members or the coroner as to how that person came by that de their death. Um, the, the, the inquest I'm thinking of, that there was a, a, a fall in a care home that wasn't recorded. It wasn't um, identified until some weeks later. Um, and the recording and the, and the management of this was not particularly well done. And this 
resulted in an inquest where there were about 23 uh, care home staff witnesses um, from a very junior level all the way to senior uh, management, which the coroner requested to come for him to, to provide evidence as to what happened. And it was resulted in a week long inquest with substantial criticism from the family in that particular event. But many inquests are much shorter than that, many are much briefer and they are um, uh, heard within sort of hours or, or days rather than week long inquests. So the circumstances that might give rise to concerns may, may be uh, concerns from the coroner, may be concerns from the family, or they may be concerns from one of the treating clinicians if it's a healthcare inquest. So what is the purpose of an inquest? As I say before, briefly, I'm just looking at my timing. Um, the coroner needs to answer four statutory questions and, and for the completion of the, the record of inquest, they are set out uh, clearly as who the person was, when they died and where they died and how they died. So the first three questions were always um, explained by the coroner as, as being relatively straightforward, usually relatively straightforward. And it is the how they died, which will depend on um, uh, whether the, the inquest is uh, an Article 2 or non-Article 2 inquest. Now you might have heard reference to Article 2 and non-Article 2. So Article 2 means Article 2 of the European Convention on Human Rights which is the right to life. So it's whether that article is engaged or not will determine the scope potentially of a, an inquest. Um, again, the legal basis of and the case law around whether it's Article 2 or non-Article 2 could form an entire um, training session uh, or days of your lives, um, but we won't go into that in, in a huge amount of detail beyond which, beyond saying, um, an Article 2 inquest uh, is, is potentially a wider inquest um, and we'll look at uh, issues beyond um, that which is directly in front of the coroner. Death in Article 2, they look at the question is how is treated more broadly and is to be read as including the purpose of us ascertaining circumstance, in what circumstances deceased came by their death. In reality, in terms of how that relates to an inquest proceeding, all inquests are, are intended to be open and full and, and thorough. Um, in practice, as I say, Article 2 is potentially wider in scope and has implications also for conclusions. Um, in Article 2 inquests, there is um, allowance for criticisms of state bodies with failings and they are potentially more judgmental. And there are um, implications in terms of the findings that the coroner can find in, in Article 2 inquests. In terms of the healthcare setting, the threshold for an Article 2 inquest is fairly high. As I said, we could go into this more detail, but we won't hear. Um, but um, it is usual that uh, most healthcare settings, and I say this slightly um, uncertain with some um, uncertainty, but most inquests, some straightforward inquests, are, are, will be non uh, Article 2 inquests. So, in terms of what to expect of the process of an inquest. So in terms of the procedure, what happens? Inquests should be concluded within six months and must be con concluded within 12 months. There are still some inquests that are um, a bit of a result of the COVID backlog. There are one or two, uh, well, depending on the coroner, depending on the area, that um, are, are way beyond that 12 month period, but um, there is an, a concerted effort to address this. So before an inquest hearing, when uh, the coroner has been notified of a death, uh, the notification is made um, in accordance with the notification guidelines, and then the coroner will open the inquest formally. The coroner will then uh, undertake an initial investigation and request uh, disclosure. So that may include uh, requests for statements and documentation, and it would usually go direct to the uh, organisation rather than individual witnesses. Um, so if you're a, a clinician working within a hospital trust or a, um, a social care environment, then the request for information will go to the organisation in most cases. Um, and that might include a request for um, so in, uh, investigation reports, complaints, documentation, um, policies, procedures, uh, uh, statements, uh, post-mortem report will be usually obtained by a coroner, depending on the circumstances. And it, Essentially, that the coroner can um, has a power to require evidence to be given or produced to them, and that can include any documentation that they consider appropriate for, to assist them in their in, uh, coronial investigation. Uh, medical records, obviously, is, uh, are documents that are usually requested, but it also can include things like CCTV um, 
uh, records, training records, uh, policies and procedures. Um, and that will be an initial collation of evidence and pulling together the information that the coroner might need to make an understanding of, of what the circumstances of the death are. Um, the, there are uh, offences around failing to comply with um, providing of evidence under Schedule 6 of the Coroners and Justice Act. Um, and it provides that where the coroner has provided a notice to give evidence and there is evidence of any alteration of that evidence or preventing of that evidence being given, um, there are penalties with fines up to um, a thousand pound or imprisonment. That, that's rarely used, but it's just to know that if, if a documentation is required by a coroner, that, then you are required to provide it uh, to the extent that you can. So once collation of evidence is uh, obtained by the coroner, there is usually a pre inquest review hearing. Um, this would have uh, usually an agenda which sets out um, what the issues are before the coroner. It would usually um, consider um, who are the uh, parties, the interested persons of an inquest um, and who the witnesses should be. Um, an interested person is someone or some organisation who has the right to actively participate in an inquest, so the right to ask questions. And it is usual or not always the case that um, hospitals or, or um, social care providers or uh, care homes, whatever, uh, would be legally re represented. It's, as I say, it's not always the case, but if there um, uh, are potential significant issues in, the, in, in an inquest, it would be usual to have a legal representative for that properly interested party. Um, the properly interested person is someone, as I say, who has the right to actively participate participate um, and has had some involvement in the circumstances of the death of that individual. Um, so the coroner will determine at that point usually who those parties are and who the witnesses are. There may be witnesses who are not interested parties who are providing factual information, but usually they are identified at this stage. Um, the uh, pre inquest review hearing would also consider the scope of um, the inquest as well and usually make a determination as to whether it is Article 2 or not, Article 2 if it hasn't already been determined. Issues would also be considered as whether uh, a jury is required to um, hear the inquest and um, whether there are any additional evidence or information that is needed um, in order for the coroner to um, continue with the investigation. And then you usually set out a formal timetable as to when the inquest hearing will uh, take place. So the inquest is a formal court process. When the coroner um, makes a request for information uh, and sets out timescales for that information, it is a requirement that, that those timescales are uh, complied with unless there are good reasons not to do so. Obviously, during COVID, there was um, some, well, there were in, with most coroners, there was understanding of their, of their local area and the pressures that are on healthcare professionals in terms of particular um, uh, provision of information. But the, the, the um, backstop is that if a coroner requires information, um, it has to be provided within the timescales. So in terms of the um, point of an inquest, in terms of determining those four questions, the other uh, duty that a coroner has is uh, to make a prevention of future death reports. Again, this is a subject in its own right. Um, this is, um, uh, and, you know, training could be provided on Regulation 28 reports and future death reports um, to, in, uh, and how to avoid them essentially and, and what they are. But essentially the coroner must make a report where during the investigation they, they reveal something that gives rise to a concern of future deaths. So it's about identifying uh, any issues of concern, any uh, elements of care that um, could have been done better or are not to the standard that would be expected and identifying those um, in order to learn lessons and take action to address um, those uh, issues. Usually um, it would be certainly my intention to get to the time of the inquest hearing having identified those lessons um, and for there had to be a, a clear evidence of the action that had been taken by the organisation to address those. In circumstances where the, at the end of the inquest the coroner still has concerns about issues it is at that point the coroner will consider whether a future, prevention of future death report is required. Now the PFDs are published, they are shared with the CQC and they do have implications for um, press uh, and media uh, 
so as I say, it would usually be uh, the intention to get to the point of the inquest where we could it provide assurances to the coroner that where their lessons need to be learned, they have been learned and action has been taken. As I say, Regulation 28 reports um, are again a training session in their, in their own right, but I bring it up here to, so that if you are asked to provide evidence for an inquest, you are aware to what um, capacity you're giving that evidence. You may be required to provide a statement as someone who has been directly involved in the care of the deceased, or you may be required to provide um, uh, a statement in terms of the involvement in a serious investigation um, uh, or in terms of the Regulation 28 evidence uh, to provide an overview or provide that senior level of um, assurance to the coroner that, that action has been taken. So in terms of why you might have been called to attend an inquest, um, as I say, the coroner uh, can provide can call witnesses to provide evidence in respect of his section, uh, regulation 28 duties but most witnesses um, will be required to provide details of um, their involvement with an individual the coroner has a wide discretion to request any individual to provide a statement or report or to produce relevant documents or to attend an inquest to give evidence as i say it is a formal coronial process and therefore if you're called to an inquest or you're called to provide that evidence um, unless you've got a good reason not to do it, um, you, you should provide it, otherwise you might be found in contempt of court. Um, some coroners prefer to uh, provide to request statements from numerous witnesses um, and all individuals involved in the care of an individual. Others limit it to those who they've identified as being directly relevant or um, leave to potentially the, the organisation to identify you know, one or two witnesses who might assist in the inquest process. Um, these are usually witnesses of fact, although they can also be witnesses who can provide a senior overview in the circumstances or say a period of admission of care. Um, uh, so there are different circumstances in which you might be asked to provide a witness statement. The key point to take away is that you should understand before you provide that statement clearly as to what capacity you're being asked to give that information. Just conscious of the fact I've got light streaming down onto my screen now. Um, so. You may have involvement in a particular incident and you may be required to provide a chronological factual statement um, of details of a particular incident or, or a broad overview of a particular period of care. Um, you may have been asked to attend or provide evidence because you are sufficiently senior to provide that overview or you have a, um, an ability to at least have reviewed the records and provide an overview that is uh, to assist the coroner. You may be asked to provide a statement because of your particular familiarity with that patient um, or whether it, you had some direct involvement in the particular incident that caused the death or it may be because you are the author of the serious investigation report or have some had some involvement in the actions that have arised since the since the death as i say be clear about the purpose of the statement that you've been asked to um, provide if you consider when you're being asked to provide that statement that there is someone better placed than you to inform the coroner of the information that is requested then that is a discussion that you need to have with your legal services team um, if uh, prior to someone can have then then have that conversation uh, with the coroner's team as well um, so if you're asked to provide a statement uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll then be uh, required to attend an inquest hearing it's usually inquested your attendance is usually requested informally but if if uh, there's any doubt witness summons will be uh, issued. Coroners are increasingly used witness, using witness summons, I find. Um, and as I say, any failure to attempt uh, to attend may result in the contempt of court. So looking at then witness statements again, we could talk for a long time about witness statements because they are both fairly straightforward, but also quite complicated. I mean, a, a lot of it is common sense, but in terms of just setting out the the, the um, requirements of a statement. It's just useful to touch again on, on some of the basics. Know who is requesting the statement. Who, Where is that request coming from? What is the capacity in which you're being asked to provide that statement? I've already mentioned. Identify the sources of information that you need for that statement, whether you're relying on your memory of a particular uh, incident, uh, perhaps a, a fall of a patient or uh, an incident you, you witnessed, um, whether it's entirely reliant on the medical records and identify those sources in, within your statement as well. So it's clear what um, the extent of your involvement and the limits of your, your uh, 
um, involvement is. And identify the timescales for providing statements. Everyone is aware that everyone is under considerable stresses at the moment um, and is unlikely to change in any way. So if it's absolutely not possible to provide a statement within the, the timescale that you've been asked to provide it with, um, again, it's, it's helpful to have that update at an early stage so that extensions can be requested if necessary and, and there can be appropriate liaison with the coroner to, to establish a reasonable timescale. So there's no guarantee that you will get any extensions, but um, if your legal team are aware at an early stage, they can at least assist in, in um, trying to negotiate that. So the, the witness statement is the basis of your witness evidence. So if you are asked then to, to attend a, a coroner's inquest, the statement is the basis. The coroner will have seen that uh, statement in advance of the inquest and will it, it will have been shared with the other parties. So the more, in, in for general rules, the more information you can put within that statement, uh, the more helpful it is to the coroner and the more useful it will be when you get or if you get to giving oral evidence in an inquest hearing. And, and you can have that statement in front of you when you're giving your evidence and clearly it's not a, a memory test. So um, the more information, the more thorough and detailed the statement is and the better prepared it is in the first place, the more helpful it may be to you in the long run. Um, it may be that um, if you provide a, a statement which addresses any particular issues or concerns or is um, comprehensive, the coroner may not need to call you to provide oral evidence in an inquest. Um, again, there's no guarantees that will be dependent on whether there are any further queries raised by either the coroner or any of the other interested parties, but, it, but it's a possibility. So what does a good statement look like? Well, not like that. That is an example of a particularly poor statement. Um, a comprehensive witness statement, again, this is stating the obvious slightly, um, uh, should be well laid out, should have a title page, number pages, just for ease of re reading. If you keep at the back of your mind that the person who is reading your statement, the coroner, or any potentially family members or any other interested persons need to make sense of it. Uh, and that also means to um, avoid relying on um, uh, jargon and acronyms, or if, you, or if you're providing test results or particularly technical or clinical information, providing a little bit of an explanation as to what it actually means so that the coroner and the family members can um, uh, identify and understand it. Um, so the initial things that you put in the opening of a statement is obviously your details, your um, uh, who you are and, and the context in which you're providing the statement, your relevant knowledge and the documentation that you relied on. And then going to the um, main part of a statement, Obviously, how you write statement is entirely a matter for you, but there are general rules that can be followed or general principles to assist in making this uh, more straightforward. So it is usual to provide a chronology and summary of the relevant evidence. Um, it, again, it depends on the type of statement you're providing. If you're providing a sort of a factual overview of what of an incident you've witnessed, it should be set out chronologi chronologically uh, very clearly um, in terms of what the facts were with as much detail as possible. If you're providing, um, say, for instance, details of an admission over a long period of time, you clearly can't put in every single detail, but it should be um, uh, a summary of the, the relevant information and include potentially the uh, details of examination and investigations where they are relevant. It should um, consider any specific questions that have been raised by the coroner. Um, in some cases, a coroner will uh, provide details of family concerns or raise specific questions that they want addressed uh, ahead of the hearing. And to the extent that you're able to, it is useful to address, address those directly. Um, the coroner's court the, works on the balance of probability. So if it is possible, if you're providing an opinion, a clinical provision, prevent, sorry, a clinical opinion, it is uh, appropriate to understand um, or to, to use whether something is probable or possible and, 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 speak and couch things in those terms if possible. Um, as I say, address any specific concerns and, and include a concluding paragraph if there are any specific questions that you have been specifically asked to address. Again, just going back slightly to the Regulation 28 statements, they might be slightly different. Obviously, if you've been asked to provide evidence um, following an investigation or following um, uh, an action plan that's been implemented, and for the purpose of addressing any particular risk and around around Regulation 28, 
that statement will be different and that potentially requires a separate discussion with the legal team. Um, some principles, if you're being asked to provide a regulation 28 statement, is just to make sure that you're clearly aware of the action that's been taken um, and provide a, an overview, including the details of specifically when that action or um, uh, uh, event has taken place. So, it's, for example, if the if your organisation is saying that um, a particular issue has been just discussed at a a, a trust wide meeting, be able to provide details of exactly when that happened and, and what the outcome of them that was. So we're flying through this this morning. You'll be pleased to know. Professional obligations. We I touched briefly on, you know, that, that if you're asked to give evidence, then you should give evidence. You, there is a duty to provide full and frank disclosure, and that um, uh, is for all witnesses at all, le at all levels, essentially. There is a duty to the court. Any evidence that is provided is provided uh, under oath. If you are subsequently called to give inquest in a hearing, you'll be asked to swear or affirm the evidence that you're given. Um, so obviously uh, there is a duty to the court um, and not to the party. So all of evidence should should obviously be um, open and obvious, honest. And clearly the regulation, uh, a duty of candor uh, applies in terms of sharing information about um, uh, patients and acting in an open and transparent way. So, Obviously, your professional obligations again will depend on your position, whether you're providing evidence in a, in, as a as a nurse or a doctor. But there are some general uh, obligations. There was a case in 2019 of uh, you may have heard or you may not have heard of uh, Dr. Lawrence, who had been asked to attend uh, a, an inquest hearing um, by an assistant coroner and refused to attend. Uh, he was initially fined uh, 650 pounds for non-attendance and uh, whilst that it's not as simple as he just didn't turn up um the, the matter was then referred by the coroner to the police and cps for investigation and he was um then subsequently called to a magistrate's court where he was convicted and sentenced to four months in prison um in sentencing him, the district judge at the time said that there is good reason why people should attend or provide documents to a coroner when carrying out such an inquest, and that is expected to be done with full cooperation without delay. Um, there are obviously circumstances specific to that case. It's not a case that if you suddenly don't attend or you have not got a good reason to, the coroner will, will um, send you to prison, but it's just to be aware that the duty to attend, to provide full and frank disclosure, to assist the court, is a real, uh, very real duty and, and should be adhered to. Um, there is another recent uh, instance, just by way of example, of um, a failure to provide uh, investigation reports um, uh, where uh, a, a trust, I think it was the Isle of Wight, was was fined for, for not doing that as well. So there is an obligation to to assist the court and that's what it is. It's an, You're assisting the court. You're not being there to be put on trial. It's It's there to assist and help the court. Uh, there are the specific NMC and GMC obligations. Um, again, must cooperate with formal inquiries and complaints com procedures and offer all relevant documentation. And in terms of GMC, uh, a doctor must inform the GMC without delay in circumstances where they have been criticised. There is a section 22 of the coroner's inquest rules um, uh, provides for self-incrimination in which no witness at an inquest is obliged to answer any question tending to incriminate him or her and a coroner would usually give you that warning if there is any suggestion uh, in a fairly unusual circumstances that a witness would be likely to incriminate themselves. Um, so in terms of general or professional obligations, uh, that is how it is. So where are we with time? Well, we've got lots of time. I'm obviously talking very quickly or have not said enough. Um, where are we? What to expect during an inquest? Um, this is not what you should expect during an inquest. I just like the pictures. Just thought it would uh, uh, give you an idea of not what to expect. But what to actually expect? So there is at the moment still a fairly uh, a balance between having to attend in person or having to attend a remote hearing. Both of them clearly have their um, uh, pros and cons. Um, if there is any suggestion that um, the 
it, it won't assist the I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a coroner's decision essentially, but if the coroner thinks it's not appropriate for you to attend remotely or um, uh, it won't be helpful to attend remotely, he will, she will hold a uh, an inquest in person. But there are circumstances where witnesses, indeed the individual witnesses and representatives uh, are still uh, being unable to attend remotely. And that can be extremely helpful if 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 the extent of your evidence is, is likely to be fairly brief, it's fairly non-controversial. Um, you've obviously been called to an inquest in the middle of uh, other clinical commitments. So in some circumstances, this is incredibly helpful to, for, for inquest still to be held remotely. Um, in terms of um, uh, how that will work or how that does work, in fact, the coroner is always in the courtroom. So the coroner would remain in court, whether it's in person or held remotely. And, and if it's an inquest that is held with a jury, uh, that jury must be in the courtroom uh, as well. So the jury would always be there present. There is no right to attend remotely. So it's not a right, but uh, and it is determined by the coroner on a, on a case by case basis. And if uh, another party uh, objects to a particular witness or a particular party um, not attending in person, that will also be taken into consideration. Um, the coroner will also consider the quality of the evidence as well. Um, it, or, or whether that you know that it, it's expedient to, to get the inquest heard um, by allowing uh, video uh, attendance essentially. So the general principles of attending an inquest, whether it be in person or whether it be remote, are the same. Um, uh, the it's really important to have if you've got a legal representative a, a conversation with them beforehand as to what to expect uh, and raise any concerns as to what you might. Um, uh, uh, expect for the inquest hearing itself. So it is a formal court. This is a formal courtroom. Um, I sometimes have questions as to whether you should attend, uh, particularly nursing staff tend in uniform or in smart clothes that either is acceptable, but most people attend in sort of smart clothes rather than um, uniform. Um, if you are attending remotely, obviously the usual principles of, of meetings apply. You should be in a quiet and private location, not be overheard. Um, you can't, cannot uh, take any recordings or screenshots and you'll be given a warning by the coroner uh, in the opening of the inquest in, in relation to that. Obviously you need good Wi-Fi and obviously phones on silent and have an appropriate background and not be interrupted essentially. If you are attending in person, it does afford more opportunity to have discussions with, if you've got one, a legal representative there uh, that, that just immediately before the hearing. It also affords you more opportunity to have any further discussion in between the witness evidence that is heard. In terms of uh, coroner's inquest evidence, if you've been called to attend, you can sit within the, the uh, coroner's court throughout the proceedings, so you will hear everyone else's evidence, evidence that is is then heard, obviously there are gaps between uh, hearing evidence, there may be breaks for, for whatever reason. And if you are all in the court together, if you are witnesses together, it does allow you to have those conversations as to um, what is going on. Um, that's not to say that if you are attending remotely and if your legal representative is to attending remotely, you can't still have those conversations. I've had, okay, well, the usual setup is that we have um, a text message that we can have uh, comments if we need to. Obviously not when you're giving evidence. If you're giving evidence, you can't have conversations about the evidence you're giving, but in between other witnesses, it, 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 you can have those um, uh, updates if necessary. Um, so in terms of what to expect, if you're called to an inquest, if you are uh, called to attend, you go for the opening of the inquest usually, unless you've been called to attend for just a specific time. Um, you will then hear the coroner opening the inquest and explain the details of who, he is going to, who she is going to hear um, throughout the evidence um, and then the coroner will then ask you to give your evidence at the appropriate time. Usually it's chronological order but that's not always the case. Often the coroners will hear evidence from pathologist first if, if a pathologist is called or any other uh, individuals depending on um, how they determine the witness list. Um, so you'll be called to give your evidence. You'll be firstly asked to affirm or swear your evidence, um, depending on how you wish to do that. And then the coroner will ask you details of who you are, what capacity you're here, um, and just to confirm your name and qualifications. And that gives you an opportunity just to sort of take a breath before you um, uh, are asked to address specific questions. The coroner will very much lead any questioning. 
take you through a witness statement, either specific, uh, directly through your statement or um, ask you questions around the evidence that you've provided. As I said earlier, it's not a memory test, so you can have your statement in front of you and it's usually helpful um, to refer to your statement if necessary, particularly in terms of details, so particular timings or uh, a, a specific investigation result or something. Um, so if you need to, you can refer to it. But coroners do expect you to have a, a familiarity with that, ev with that evidence and don't expect you to be sort of scrabbling around for records and notes if, that you've um, not looked at. Um, often coroners will say, have you had an opportunity to, to familiarise yourself with this again, particularly if there's been a long gap between uh, the inquest hearing uh, and the death. So the coroner will take you through the questions that they want to answering in terms of the particular information. If there is a question you don't understand or you, you cannot answer, it's entirely appropriate to say so. And at the end of that, any other interested parties will have an opportunity to ask questions um, of you as well. Uh, uh, and if there is jury in place, and I'll talk about juries in a moment, I've seen a couple of questions pop up about juries, so we'll come back to that in just a minute. But if there is a jury uh, uh, sitting, then they will also have an opportunity to put questions to you via the coroner. Their questions will go through the coroner um, before they are put towards any witness. Um, once you've given your evidence, um, that is your part played essentially. So you'll be released. Uh, you may on in very some circumstances ask to remain in the event that you ask to assist further, but usually you are released um, from the inquest uh, uh, hearing. So what happens at the end of the inquest when everybody has given their evidence and everyone has um, provided details uh, that the coroner has requested? The coroner then uh, requests legal submissions essentially as to what the, the conclusion should be. This is for, um, he has a formal uh, requirement to complete the record of inquest. The coroner will make findings of facts as to the evidence that they've heard and then provide their conclusion within that um, record of inquest. Depending on the type of inquest, the conclusions may be the, either be short form or narrative. So short forms are the type of conclusions that you will have heard of um, accident, uh, suicide, uh, natural causes um, that can identify very succinctly what the cause of death was. Increasingly, co coroners are using or have used uh, narrative conclusions, which are intended as a short factual paragraph as to the circumstances of death. So, say, for example, uh, the death arose as a consequence of a necessary medical procedure or something like that, something very brief um, uh, and to the point, essentially. Uh, and at that point also, the coroner will consider whether it is necessary to make any Regulation 28 of Prevention of Future Death Reports. Hopefully, by that point, um, uh, you will be aware of any potential risk of a Regulation 28 report and it won't come as any surprise um, uh, in terms of what action is or what a further information might be requested to address uh, that report. Um, the coroner will then conclude the inquest, thank all the witnesses for attending, um, and, and clearly the family uh, as well. And that, in terms of the inquest process, uh, will be the end of it. But what happens after you've given evidence? That That is my half-hearted attempt at making someone look like they're running for the door. Um, art was never my strong point. But anyway, after, after the evidence, whilst you might want to sort of run for the door as soon as you possibly can, um, it is helpful to have um, a debrief or uh, discuss again any of the issues that have come out of the inquest, um, consider whether any support is needed for any other witnesses who have attended with you, of any colleagues, and to consider whether there is anything else in terms of lessons learned that was picked up. I mean, hopefully they will have been picked up prior to the inquest anyway, but if there's any other issues that come up as a result of the evidence of, of witnesses from other organisations that need to be addressed. Um, there may be a claim associated with the inquest itself. This is a separate process, um, but some of the uh, information will be uh, used potentially for the, for the claim. I'm not a claimant solicitor, so I don't propose to go into that in particular uh, detail. Um, but the conclusions um, may well be used as part of a claim and, and um, uh, the if the family are represented, the claim, the solicitor representing an inquest may well then also be a claimant solicitor for proceedings. Obviously, any claim will be uh, against any organisation rather than individuals, uh, but it's just uh, useful to be aware that that might be ongoing. Similarly, there might be an ongoing complaints process in place that may uh, uh, need to be revisited by the relevant individuals. 
Um, and in terms of learning, I mean, get aside from the Regulation 28 report, if there is one or any serious investigation actions that come out of it, that it's, it's useful to consider whether there's additional learning that can come out of an inquest. Supporting colleagues, so a lot to get of this is again common sense, uh, depending on your role within an organisation, whether you are going purely as a witness or whether it is part of your role within the organisation to support your colleagues who have maybe been asked. It may be that you are, again, sufficiently senior and, and a more junior member of staff who had direct involvement in an incident has been asked to attend an inquest. Um, these are some really obvious points, essentially. Assist with preparation, help a collation of documentation, very practical points. Allowing time for discussion for witness to prepare prior to the inquest. And that can be as um, straightforward as just explaining where to go, the practicalities of what you need to do when you get there and making sure that they're appropriately supported um, by whoever the relevant people are, whether it's a personal friend or whether it's a, a manager or a supervisor or how, how best to support and essentially ask person how that would help them. Um, attending an inquest is for some an extremely difficult procedure and process to go through. For others uh, it's not. It certainly depends on the circumstances of the death and the circumstances of the inquest. Um, but it is the case that some uh, witnesses require significant support and not just prior to the inquest but also after the inquest as well just to, to, to ensure that they have um, understood um, the procedure and, and a re the reiteration that the coroner is not there to put them on trial and either is the family members, but that it is um, not useful for, um, uh, well, it's not possible for the coroner to find a, a civil or criminal liability. So a debriefing follow the inquest is also often useful. And that, I think, brings me to the end at about 20 past 11. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, Hi Lisa, Perhaps. we've had a that we've we've had quite a few come through, so I'll just start from from the top. So, um, yep. do seventy two hour reviews in draft report need to be disclosed to the coroner? Uh, that will depend on the coroner. It depends what's specifically asked for. Um, some coroners I have had experience of will ask for absolutely everything, including all draft and correspondence that have gone into investigation report. Again, that's that is an issue that is subject to a much broader. Uh, discussion depending on what is being asked for. I think um, if the coroner asks for it, the usual the usual response is that the coroner can have it unless there's a reason not to. But I think it depends on um, what is in that 72 hour report. But it, it is possible the coroner to ask, certainly ask for it. I think it would we need to look at it specifically as to whether there was a good reason not to, rather than um, it, it might be presumably that the 72 hour report by the time a full report is done. That, that some of the findings might have changed significantly. So if it is disclosed, then we'll need to look at what other information is disclosed at the same time, presumably. So it is possible to be asked for, and I have known coroners to ask for absolutely everything that has gone into the report. There have been times when that's we've pushed back against that to some extent, um, but I think it's a it's a case specific um, issue. Thank you. Next question. Uh, what happens if the time scale goes over 12 months? We have a number that have exceeded the 12 months. Um, yes, there are a number that have exceeded 12 months. The, essentially, the, the coroner dealing with it has to report to the chief coroner as to why it's gone over the time scale. But from a practical point of view, um, nothing much happens over 12 months, apart from the fact it all becomes a, sometimes harder because obviously people's memories are uh, not the same as they are. I had uh, an inquest not long ago, which was about three or four years old, and 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 um, the coroner started with a with a uh, an apology essentially to the family for the circumstance. The, there was no single circumstance as to why it was delayed so long. It was just a, 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 an amalgamation of of issues. Um, but from the uh, trust or witness point of view, it obviously makes it harder to find the appropriate individuals. Some people may have moved on uh, from their employment that we were in at the time of the death. But that doesn't mean you don't then for, they therefore have to go. Um, but it might make things such as accessing records to, to refresh yourself or accessing information trickier. But there are there are a number of inquests that are still beyond 12 months. It's not it's some colonial areas have um, more of a backlog than others. I think it depends on the coroner particularly. Um, but there is not a huge amount from a, an organisational point of view that, that can be done about that, unfortunately. 
Thank you. Um, next question. Um, in a hospital setting, who decides to refer to a coroner? Um, it is usually the medic certifying the death, as far as I'm aware. Um, the, uh, I'm aware that medical examiners are now working in trust, so it will often or, or usually be a medical examiner if that there is involvement. Um, I think if there's any any uncertainty, it might then be discussed uh, with legal terms within particular hospital or trust or organisation. Um, next question. Uh, what determines a jury being involved and what is the difference? So uh, a jury will be called and I realised I'd skipped over this as I was sk skipping over it. Um, there are certain circumstances in which uh, a jury must be uh, called. So where someone died in custody, state custody, so prison or state detention, so under the mental, whilst detained under the Mental Health Act, and where the death was violent or unnatural, then there must be a jury. Um, so if you die in prison and it was a natural death, that doesn't necessarily mean you have a, a, a jury. Where the death resulted from an act or omission of a police officer or a member of the police, again, there must be a jury. And where the death was caused by an accident, poisoning or disease, um, a notifiable disease, if you will, again, there should be a jury. Um, as I say, COVID-19 is a notifiable disease, but does not normally give rise to jury uh, inquests. Uh, so that's the first bit. That's when you have the coroner also has discretion to hold inquests with a jury if they consider it is appropriate to do so. So there are certain requirements, um, but there's also discretion. And I can't remember what the second bit of the question was. So, um, and what's the difference? Um, so the difference then... is, yeah, the, the, the conclusions reached are conclusions reached by the jury. Um, the evidence is heard before a jury. Clearly, the jury have an opportunity to ask questions, and those questions are normally put to the coroner before they're put to the, the witness to ensure that they are appropriate questions. And then there are potential conclusions that are put to the jury for them to consider. So it might be a case of putting to the jury that is, you know, the death was either um, natural causes or that they, they can conclude a, a narrative. So it, it, they then make the conclusion, which is recorded on the record of inquest. Um, there is dire direction given by the coroner as to the sort of the legal um, options available and to the issues that they are able to, to consider. But it is essentially for the jury then to determine the conclusion of any inquest. I think you may have just sort of um, answered that the next question about the jury was um, where a jury is involved, what is the scope of their role, role in the inquest? Yeah, I think that's probably the same yeah. question. Let me know if there's anything other than that. Um, Somebody would like to ask your opinion about the sources of information, records versus memories, recollections when providing witness statements. I think both. I think you know, if you, it depends, doesn't it? If you're asked to write a statement on an incident that's happened a year ago, then clearly uh, your recollection is not going to be as helpful as probably, well, not clearly, but possibly your recollection is not going to be as helpful as looking at the medical records. I think in terms of providing detail, you should never try and remember, you know, the outcome of investigations or, or what happened. So I think referring to medical records and any other documents that you might be able to is, is helpful and more useful because it provides clearer evidence. I mean, the age old uh, saying that if it's not written down, it didn't happen. It is certainly still true. So if there is a, a, an entry in a medical record that that supports what your recollection is, that's really helpful to rely on as well. So I would always say use of medical records. Um, is is entirely appropriate when writing statements. But if you have a particular memory of something that isn't written down and you are on balance of probabilities certain that that occurred, then it is useful to put that in the statement as well. Thank you. Um, if the coroner finds that death of, or injury was caused by neglect and was avoidable, what happens next? So um, uh, a neglect conclusion will be recorded obviously on the record of inquest. Um, it depends really, obviously the, the, the associated um, press with a neglect conclusion is, is never going to be particularly helpful to any organisation. Um, it depends on the circumstances and neglect, whether there are still things arising within the organisation that need to be addressed, whether there is a, a Regulation 28 report in terms of the coroner's significantly concerned that circumstances arrive giving rise of a, to a future risk or um, where that uh, neglect has come from. So there are 
it may be that a neglect conclusion gives rise to the potential for a, a civil claim. It may be that the circumstances of neglect conclusion give rise to particular concerns about particular individuals that may need, then need to be considered by the trust in terms of internal processes, uh, HR or, or referrals. I would hope that if there was a potential for neglect conclusion, it had been identified way beyond the point you get to the inquest so that the significant and appropriate action had been taken beforehand um, in terms of uh, uh, internal organisational processes, you know, be it HR training, whatever. I would hope, or, and, and I would always, you know, when, when we're giving support to organisations, uh, if there is any I suggestion that neglect is a conclusion, that would be uh, identified early and, and everything would be done to give assurances to the coroner um, that that situation didn't still arise uh, would be done. In terms of a neglect conclusion, you cannot ever change the facts of a case. Obviously, you're there to provide details of those facts. So if you get a neglect conclusion and that is recorded on record, because that is as it is, depending on you know the time proximity of whether this was you know a week ago, two years ago, the impact might be different. But um, in terms of the impact on or what happens next, I think it depends on those circumstances. Depends on on what action has already been taken, um, uh, whether it's in relation to the actions of an individual or an organisation. There may well be uh, uh, an investigation by CQC if they are, well, the CQC will be aware of it because um, uh, in circumstances where there are significant concerns, the CQC will probably be notified. Uh, if there's a Regulation 28, they will have a copy of that in any event. It may give rise to investigation by the CQC and other uh, relevant bodies. Um, it may give rise to a potential claim. Uh, so <laughs> it's not something you want to have, obviously, um, but that's what would potentially happen next. It depends on the circumstances again, but that in general terms. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, do people need to inform their registering body if, if their practice is cri criticised in the investigation report or only if the coroner sizes so I can't quite remember the provision but there is a provision that doctors need to uh, inform the um, registering body if they are criticized um, I, I'd have to look at the detail out again and come back to you on that one um, certainly when the coroner criticizes there is it's necessary to refer um, to refer yourself usually uh, but um, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to come back to you on that one off the top of my head. Um, and then does the coroner get fined if it goes over 12 months? No, is the, is, is the, is the short answer. No. Okay. Um, so I see we've got somebody's hand up. We'll, we'll open it up to the floor now. Um, Annabella, I think you've got your hand raised. No, no. No. Um... Yeah, yes, thank you. Lisa has already uh, answered myself, my question, sorry. Uh, yes, she quite told what, that uh, it would be perhaps useful if we had some kind of recollection to add to our evidence based on medical records, if I understood you, when providing witness statements. Yes, thank you, that's all. Sorry, I've forgotten the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, and just to add as well, um, it depends on again the capacity you've been asked to provide a statement, and you might have you might not even even met the individual that you've been asked to write a statement about. You might have had no contact at all, in which case your like your statement will be entirely based on other people's records, presumably. Um, so it just depends on. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks. Um, we've just had a, a chat, um, a question through the chat. Um. If the coroner tells you to refer yourself, do, um, do they check that you've done this? Again, I, you've obviously identified the bit of information in my head that's not there. Um, the area about self-referral, I don't know. I don't think so, but I would have to double check and I can come back to you on that one if, if, uh, if uh, yeah. Um, we've got uh, Sonia, you've got your hand raised. Oh, hi, morning. Um, I was just wondering how, uh, enforceable Regulation 28 reports are? So, Regulation 28 reports, BFDs are issued and you have to respond within 56 days. Um, 
it's the duty of the coroner to provide the regulation 28 report. If the, after that 56 days and you provide a res the organisation provides a response that the coroner is not happy with, um, it is then open to the coroner to, to consider that further. Um, in terms of enforceable, I suppose it depends what's in, the, in it. The coroner can't compel anyone to take action. They can't, they can't they can't tell you exactly what to do in, ter in terms of those specific concerns that are raised. I think there is some debate as to whether Regulation 28 reports are punitive or whether they are intended to assist organisations with making changes. I think various coroners have various different views on this. Um, in some cases, they can be extremely helpful in, in, in prompting an organisation to make a change that may have been thought about but hadn't had the necessary uh, impetus to, to be implemented. In other cases, I've had experience of, of uh, in the past, not so recently, I have to say, where uh, Regulation 28 reports have been extremely broad um, and not always necessarily directed to the right organisation. So it's open to a coroner, obviously, to, to make a Regulation 20 report to anybody. It may not be directed to trust. It may be in terms of national policy or towards um, NICE or Secretary of State for Health or, you know, much broader. So it's really important that at the end of an inquest, if there is a Regulation 20 report, that report is directed to the right organisation that can implement or at least report on what action has been taken. So in terms of um, how they can enforce it, I don't think they have direct ability to enforce it because they can't actually make direct um, uh, recommendations of specific actions that should be taken. But obviously, those reports go to the CQC. They obviously are published. I mean, the, the famous, well, the, the, the well-known Regulation 20 report is relation to the um, Pretamonja case. You'll recall the, the one around uh, um, the death of that of the, the young girl and labelling of, uh, of um, food products. So that, um, you know, was well publicised, which, you know, that in itself I suspect has something to do with changes that were made in terms of um, publicity and the, the pressure that put on the organisation in this case in that case a particular um, company so I don't think they can specifically um, compel an organisation to, to, to make changes but the pressure of a Regulation 28 report should be sufficient to at least consider necessary because if you then have another inquest where the coroner is making um, raising the same issues you can guarantee that there'll be criticism if if you've had a previous regulation 28 report which has raised exactly the same issues and there's no been no changes implemented or he is not assured of a previous uh, that previous action has been taken or you know if, if an organization has said that action has been taken and, and and clearly it hasn't been so um i think the effects are debatable depending on coroner and depending on your point of view as to the effect you know, as to a regulation 28 report but they can't actually compel an organisation to take specific action. Just got one final question. Uh, what should you, what should one wear to an inquest? Um, if you're remote hearing um, from at least from the top up, you should be wearing presentable clothes. Um, uh, obviously, you'll be seen. It, you'll be seen by the coroner and everyone in the court. Um, you will need to turn your video on if you're at a remote hearing. So. Um, uh, um, you should be at least presentable from the waist up if, if in that circumstances. Um, depends if you are um, a professional, it's usual to wear a suit or at least shirt and uh, you know, smart wear, essentially, not jeans is what was, was all I would say. I think I touched, just mentioned earlier, but if you're a, uh, a nurse, you, it is open to wear a uniform if you want. And, and actually, again, in the past, a um, long time ago, though, now, actually, someone had said to me, actually, it makes a, a, a nurse, a member of nursing staff feel as though they are giving evidence in their professional capacity rather than their personal. So it, it sort of keeps that level of detachment. But I haven't come across people giving evidence in nursing uniform for quite a long time. So um, usually people just go in smart clothes. Just another question has come through. Uh, can witnesses or family ask for a break? Yes, absolutely. Families in particular, obviously, um, the whole inquest proceeding can be extremely distressing for a family. So the coroners are very aware of families needing to have 
uh, a break or if there is signs that um, they are becoming distressed or upset. And again, witnesses, I've had circumstances where witnesses have become upset in the whilst giving evidence and, and uh, either the coroner has suggested a break or their legal representative or someone else has said, you know, can we take a, a five minute break? Obviously, if you're in the middle halfway through your evidence, giving evidence and uh, either the family or um, uh, the coroner says we're going to have a break, then um, you cannot then discuss your evidence with uh, anyone around you. Um, but yes, families and and witnesses and anyone else in the courtroom essentially can ask the coroner. The coroner might not always say it's a convenient time, but um, yeah, certainly. Um, and it's just a, a follow up question on that one. Um, can the corridor ask for reporting to be restricted, um, for example, in the case of a suicide of a child? Yes, there are provisions where the coroner can ask for reporting to be strict. I couldn't give you chapter and verse um, just this morning, but there are circumstances. Um, OK, I think that's that's all the questions we've uh, that have come through. And with that, it's uh, just to say thank you very much for attending and I hope you found the, the webinar useful. Thank you.